In Slump Pro Setup and Run Part 3, we're going to be pushing Slump Pro to its limit, finding out what it can do and what it can't do, and where that boundary is, and talking about that. Well there you go, it took 9 minutes and 17 seconds to produce one part automatically and it runs automatically unattended, I can go away and do something else for the next 12. So that won't take long to do that production, but of course it took me about 3 hours to set all the tools and do the conversational programming. And that's net time. There's always a little bit more time involved in sort of unpredictable little nuisance jobs. You know, I had trouble with this coolant uh, line moving on me. And when it moves, you, do, you don't have the jet of coolant anymore and your chip braking doesn't work. So you have to fix it. So I had to make this little block up here so that I could hold the coolant line more securely. And, and you can be sure that every time you set up your lathe to run automatically, there'll be one little problem or another. And in the first few jobs, there'll be several problems as you gradually get up to speed and get all the tools sorted out. So while the net time might be only three hours, um, you've really got to allow four or five hours and more than that for the first few jobs. So um, say a three hour setup time, and uh, but a very short run time. Compare that with a manual lathe. To make this part in the manual lathe with the multiple tool offsets and all the quick change tool holders, I'd typically take about an hour and a half to make the first part and each part subsequently would probably take about one hour. So you're talking a uh, break even point at sort of three or four parts it's equal on a manual lathe or a CNC lathe. Any more than three or four parts, the CNC lathe is winning. So you can see for 12 parts, it's clearly worthwhile. But yeah, while the net time might only be an hour or two to set the tools up and an hour or so to do the program, there's always all the little extra wee niggly jobs um, for probably the first few months of production you know you're always going to find there's something you need that slows you down you're going to need to make a special shim or you're going to need to make a special split bush or you're going to need to make a moss taper sleeve or you're going to need to make a coolant support block and all these things uh, seem to drag on you know you never have quite the right tool every job is different um, and so you might as well write off the first few jobs as being cost effective. You know, it's fine if it's a hobby, that, that's great, it's an enjoyable hobby. But if, if you're looking to um, run a competitive uh, contract machine shop, then it's good to be aware of these things up front. To get me started with mounting taper shank drills, when I first got the mill, I just quickly bored out a couple of sleeves uh, with tapered IDs for Morse 1 and Morse 2. That's a Morse 2 there. This is a Morse 1. We just bought it to fit the taper shank drill, put a flat on it, and it's held with two grub screws. I wasn't sure if that would have enough hold, 
but it, it works fine um, so far anyway up to two Morse uh, drilling steel. It's uh, a little bit rough and ready but it's quick and cheap. Just having a look at that coolant tube reinforcing block. You can see the uh, ball end of the tube pushes into that soft plastic sleeve in that coolant line there and there's an M8 cap screw. I've just got a little grub screw on the side so I can nip it up. Can't do it up too tight obviously. There's the dimensions there. Just a little uh, piece of aluminium with a 20 millimeter centers, a 9 mil hole for the M8 and a 4.9 for the copper tube with a little grub screw on the side. This edit conversation software facility is really brilliant. So you have a look here, you can just click on a particular uh, piece of code and see graphically uh, the toolpath. So you can go through and check each one that you've got it in the right order. There's the chanfers, there's the spot, there's the pilot, there's the 17 mil drill, there's the bore, there's the internal chanfer. Just, just showing it to you clearly there. All sorts of double checks within the software, it's been well thought through. Well that was a bit scary, I can tell I'm right on the edge with the uh, torque of the spindle. Um, if you have a look down there at that tool, that's my main turning tool and I've just put a new tip in it because I could hear the spindle starting to slow down at that big diameter. You know, that, that's the limiting factor of this machine, the torque of the spindle at 70 millimeters diameter. And because it's a horrible, sticky, uh, mild steel, uh, commercial quality, it doesn't have sulfur or lead in it, so it's weldable. That means it's sticky and tough to machine. You need a reasonably deep depth of cut and a reasonably heavy feed to chip break um, and that's almost too much for this machine so I've got to watch that I'm almost stalling uh, I don't know whether I'm slipping the belt or slowing the motor down I think I'm slowing the motor down I just want to go a little bit more deeply into the subject of uh, large diameter steel work and the limited spindle torque of Slant Pro we know from doing this job, which is 70 millimeters diameter, that it will cut that okay, um, that we can take a one millimeter depth of cut and a fairly heavy feed rate, which allows chip breaking, there's the tool there, allows chip breaking and running unattended and removes metal quite efficiently so we can get the job made in a few minutes. So that's great. So we can go up to 70 millimeters, but we also know from when I took a, an, an unintended bigger facing cut that we can't take a much bigger cut than that. We, if we go any bigger than a millimeter it becomes unreliable. It gets to the point of stalling the motor. So, uh, so that's a, a real limiting factor, 70 millimeters. You know, you, I know some of you will be thinking, yeah, but just take lighter cuts. Uh, have, a, have, a, have a lighter feed rate, but the problem with lighter cuts, shallower depth of cuts and a shallower feed rate is that it may not chip break well and you get strings and rat's nests of swarth coming off. Uh, you need a heavy cut and a heavy feed rate to get good chip breaking and the whole point of a CNC lathe is to run unattended, especially if you want to do competitive CNC machining work. So. Um, so you're a bit stuck there and also even if you could get it to run with a special tool taking shallow cuts uh, requiring less torque and, and it would chip break and run automatically, even if you could do that, it would still take a long time and it wouldn't be a competitive machine anymore because it would take too long to make each part. So it's only efficient. Uh, to machine large diameter steel parts up to about 70 millimeters or 3 inches. Um, so this, this, this is the limiting factor. In order to get bigger diameter work we need more spindle torque. Thanks for following me on this guys. Catch you later.